Okay, folks, we're recording. Uh, so welcome again to our Ontario Open Library Network uh, monthly community webinar. Uh, again, my name is Lillian Hogendor and I'm our Digital Access and Open Educational Resources Lead. Um, and these webinars are really about sharing the work that's going on in our community or bringing sort of new ideas, new tools, new perspectives to our community in Ontario. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about hypothesis using web annotation in the online classroom. Uh, so we have a number of great panelists here today that you'll get to hear from. First, we've got Jeremy Dean, who's the uh, Director of Education at Hypothesis. Then we've got Brent, who is a faculty member. He teaches English and Cultural Studies at Trent. And also, uh, we have the joy and pleasure of being able to hear from a student today. Albana is here uh, from Trent University. She's a fourth year English student that has been using Hypothesis in Brent's class. Um, so again, please put your questions in the q and I'm so looking forward to this lively uh, discussion and I won't take any more of your time. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to uh, Jeremy right now, who's gonna give us a brief intro to uh, Hypothesis. Thanks, Lillian. Let me just get my screen up here. Good morning, folks. Um, really excited to be here uh, with everybody. Uh, I'm, J I'm Jeremy Dean from Hypothesis, um, and I'm gonna just provide a brief intro to our company and, and our project uh, with some ideas about uh, Hypothesis in the classroom and then turn it over to the experts. Uh, really looking forward to hear from Brent and Albana. Um, so this, my little piece of the presentation uh, does have a bit.ly link, but I know that Lillian uh, will also be sharing this um, as a resource later. So obviously when we think about, you know, e-learning, uh, we're sort of in a new era in the, over the past five, six weeks or so with, uh, with COVID um, and a lot more people moving online to take advantage of, uh, you know, online teaching resources and learning resources. And I've been thinking about this a lot as, especially those of us that are used to teaching face-to-face -face, move into the online space. And I, was, I, was, I remembered a quote from Jennifer Howard in the Chronicle of Higher Education about, tools like hypothesis, sometimes called social reading tools, sometimes called collaborative annotation tools. And this quote sort of has a uh, added emphasis, I think, in this, in this age of, of uh, you know, increased online learning. Online, a book can become a gathering place, a shared space where readers record their reactions and conversations. Of course, you'll see how this is true, but I think it's, again, all the more important today as we lose the face-to-face -face classroom experience to a degree and we're using Zoom and other resources that try to come face to face, um, but we need more tools of engagement, more, more tools of community. Uh, I think annotation can be a particularly powerful one. Quickly about Hypothesis, we're, sort of, we're very unique as an ed tech company. Um, all our code is open source. We've also helped steward and uh, advocate for open standards in annotation practices, so that the kind of technology that we're building is not something we consider proprietary to ourselves. It's something we want users to own. It's something that we want technologists to innovate upon uh, and take in their own directions. And so it's a pretty unique approach to technology and especially education technology. Here's a glimpse of our team. Uh, I did see that my colleague Nate uh, up there in the upper left-hand corner is on hand and uh, probably to answer questions in the chat. So hello to Nate. Um, and I think we have some actually some new folks from Hypothesis that have also joined the webinar that aren't yet in this slide. So that's a note to myself to, to update it. Um, I'm an English professor by training. Uh, I got a PhD in English at UT Austin, which is where I am uh, today in Austin, Texas. Uh, and well before I started teaching online, you know, annotation was something I considered vital to my own uh, academic uh, scholastic success, but also to my, my teaching and ultimately to my students performance in my class. I knew annotation was key. And I would always hand out this poem, you know, print it out uh, and hand it out physically to students in the classroom on the first day of uh, class along with the syllabus. Um, it's a poem called Marginalia by Billy Collins. This is just a little piece of it, but it's basically an ode to annotation. And we hand it out to try to inspire them to write in their books. We've all seized the white perimeter as our own and reached for a pen if only to show we did not just laze in an armchair turning pages. We pressed a thought into the wayside planted an impression along the verge. Uh, so for those of us in education today, you know, that we recognize this as a kind of active uh, learning, right? Um, it's, not, it's not something particularly new. Active reading is not something particularly new uh, as well. A annotation has been around for centuries, right? Uh, students have written in books, scholars have written in books since probably before the invention of the book. 
Um, it helps us better comprehend material that we're looking at. It helps us begin to develop our own critical ideas around material. Um, again, it's not something uh, new, but as we start to deliver content online and start to send readings to students online, we often lose this ability to write in the margins. Um, and so part of what Hypothesis does is kind of resurrect the margin, if you will, uh, for those that are reading online, which we know to be critical from research because we hear that uh, studies suggest that students that are, reading on, that are reading online aren't retaining as much, they're not as engaged. And so this traditional practice of annotation brought online can counter, um, you know, be a counter effect for those um, reading online experiences. Um, in addition to that though, some new things can happen in terms of annotation as it moves online. Um, you can still have that traditional private marginal note layer, that bottom uh, pink layer on top of any document online, um, but you can also have other layers of annotation, uh, social layers of annotation, different types of social layers of annotation. So for example, on some, you know, some uses of hypothesis, there's a public layer. You can go to uh, you know, the WashingtonPost.com and turn on hypothesis and annotate on a particularly on, on any on any article and see if there are existing annotations and get into conversations in a public uh, forum with others. You can also create any number of private groups to bring together communities of colleagues or communities of students uh, to read together online and to work through difficult text together online. So you see here the marginal layered uh, private margin, uh, but also private groups maybe amongst colleagues, private groups for courses, and then a public channel uh, as well. I'm gonna distill three sort of takeaways that I've gotten from uh, faculty and students that have used Hypothesis, uh, broad sort of statements about how we've seen it uh, powerful in, in the classroom for, for users. Um, and then of course, we're gonna hear the stories from Brent and Albana, which I think uh, will, will be even more powerful than, than my sort of uh, top level things here. But in any case, um, one of the things we say about hypothesis is that it makes reading active. Again, this is nothing radically new. This is something that's, you know, teachers have asked students to try to do with annotation and other means um, uh, for a long, long time before, before online learning. Um, I will say that one of the cool things about, you know, reading online and annotating online is that there are new ways to be active, right? You can see here that students in the snapshot here have used, you know, images and memes to annotate a poem right, to learn to compose and think through uh, with, with images their interpretations of a piece of text. So that multimedia piece is something that's new in terms of the way that we can uh, write in the margins. You know, I've, I just had, you know, asterisks and little brief notes. I couldn't draw pictures and things like that. But now you can illustrate your annotations, illustrate text that you're reading with images, video, hyperlinks to other documents and things like that. Far richer than what's possible with a pen and a highlighter. Hypothesis also makes reading visible. And this is something that's really, really powerful to me because I used to hand out that Billy Collins poem and then grade my, my students six weeks later on a final paper, right? Assuming they'd done the annotation, assuming they had taken good notes, assuming they had highlighted and identified critical passages and said interesting analytic things about those passages, I would grade the final product, uh, the writing that resulted from their reading and annotating, um, but I never was there for them, never present, never guided them in their annotation practice. I think it's really powerful to make that practice, make reading visible uh, for both instructors and students and to engage in that early moment of encountering a text. And by the way, it doesn't just have to be an English text, right? I've heard from you know, people that are training clinicians in the medical field that close reading, identifying specific important pieces of textual evidence and grounding claims in particular pieces of text is nothing particular to the humanities. This is valuable across uh, high, the curriculum of higher ed. Um, and then finally, hypothesis makes reading social. And I'll be really curious to hear about this from Albana especially, but this is a, one of my favorite quotes from a student that we've, that has used hypothesis. Um, hypothesis is my literary Facebook. When I'm reading, I sometimes wonder, does anyone actually understand this? Am I crazy? With this tool, I know I'm not alone. I had this experience when I was in grad school, right? Reading something you know, weird like Derrida, right? And being like, what is this? It doesn't even seem like English um, in terms of the concepts and the language being used. It would have been so amazing to have classmates there to uh, also express their confusion, but also to share in the unpacking of that uh, difficult text, to you know, take turns on glossing it, to collaborate on unpacking a particularly uh, deep and complicated piece of writing together and not to be alone in that process. So 
those are some three uh, top level ideas for how hypothesis uh, is powerful for students and teachers. Um, but I, you know, let's hear from the experts uh, in that regard because these folks are coming from the trenches and um, I'm curious to hear their stories. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Uh, that was really uh, enlightening. I, I, and you'll be sharing the link to that presentation as well, correct? So um, folks, if you're here or uh, if you're watching this, uh, we'll make sure that you have a link to uh, anything shared during the session. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Brent. Um, and Brent's gonna just talk to us a little bit about his experience teaching with Hypothesis at Trent. Take it away, Brent. Thanks, Lillian. And I wanna thank Jeremy and Albana for being here and all the um, participants in chat. I'm enjoying watching the uh, conversation unfold around whether you annotate your own books or not. I'm certainly in the camp of I write in my books if I own them. Uh, right, so, <clears throat> I'm gonna give a little bit of background um, behind the course uh, that I am using Hypothesis in at the moment um, and talk a little bit about how I implemented it in um, that course. So about this time last year, I started with the uh, Trend Online Pilot Program um, and working with Maureen Glynn, who's the senior e-learning designer at Trent Online to take a third year English class literature and globalization and um, redevelop it as an online class. So um, it was uh, this course, I was encouraged by my chair, Hugh Hodges, to think of a course that I could particularly uh, move over to the online setting um, and an upper year course too, because often students will need that third year credit. So I chose literature and globalization because one of my areas of research is energy systems, resources, and narratives, sort of an energy humanities, if you will. Um, and I saw that as a compelling to me vector through literature and globalization to sort of bring energy into the conversation. So one thing Maureen um, encouraged me to think about was like, move away from your idea of how you model your teaching in the classroom, uh, towards something new. So the course is based around sort of six learning modules um, and each one includes a kind of fieldwork exercise. So these exercises, for example, um, are to have students take an object that's close to them. So I just have like a little plastic technical pencil uh, and to think about how strange it is that this has petrocarbons in it that uh, this plastics that it's manufactured somewhere and then shipped to us, like start to unpack the history of these objects around us and think about their um, environmental impact and energy impact and that sort of thing. Uh, so this doesn't sound very much like an English class to some people perhaps, but uh, the idea through this field work was to move from a reading of the objects around us and their kind of imbrication and energy systems towards uh, literary readings. And so this is where hypothesis um, fits in. It was perfect for this kind of fieldwork exercise where uh, students um, would kind of go away and do some work and then, and then write about it and share their experience in a kind of reflection with the class. Um, so, the one thing I wanted to mention is uh, we were thinking about how are we going to um, make this work in a class with 90 plus students, having them all sign up for hypothesis might be uh, something some would not be interested in. Some students want to are, are nervous about uh, third party apps and this sort of thing. But we were actually able to uh, work with hypothesis to use the integration with our learning. Um, management system. And so it meant students wouldn't need to sign up and they could just kind of use it right away. Um, it also allows for uh, this kind of, as Jeremy was pointing out, multiple asynchronous collaborators. So students can kind of pop in and out and make comments at any time. I'm going to come back to this field work uh, in just a moment. But first, the first place we used it was actually to have students mark up the syllabus. So the first exercise in the introduction module was just like, what questions do you have here? Here's this, this uh, instance of the syllabus that you can go to 
and students would kind of ask questions and then be able to um, answer one another if someone had sort of figured something out. Um, and then I would be able to go in and respond as well. This was sort of the first thing to sort of have students dip their toes, get used to the tool kind of a thing. Um, the field work activity, uh, more specifically, built on this idea of uh, fossil fuels uh, and other forms of energy really uh, support our, our ways of life. We're really um, energy creatures these days. Um, but it used hypothesis to have students annotate seven stories that appeared in The Guardian um, that were uh, about oil directly or indirectly. And they were, the assignment was basically to have them um, select a story and leave one to two annotations, as Jeremy kind of showed us, um, interpreting what's going on there, filling in some historical background, just kind of adding that marginalia, right? And they were also encouraged to respond to uh, just one to two um, posts. But then the task was to take, to leave those responses on one story and then move to another one in order to um, draw on the kind of commentary there, uh, the marginalia there, to produce their own kind of reading of a story. So kind of the idea is to um, have, it's kind of a layered thing, to have them read, uh, to have them formulate and express their own ideas, um, to have them engage and build on other student work, um, and to have them kind of show off how they understand, uh, synthesize, and express this set of thoughts. Um, it's self-directed too, like students can, um, the toughest part was for the first couple students who were like, there's nothing here to respond to yet. How do I complete this now? It's like, well, you're gonna have to leave your notes and check back later, right? Uh, the other students will get to it, you know, for the first few folks who got there. Um, and, and it was amazing when I checked in because I hadn't done this before, like to be candid, this is my first online class that I've taught. Um, and I haven't, aside from the kind of pilot program course that Maureen Glenn set up for us uh, to work through, this is the first, I haven't taken an online class either. Um, but I was amazed to check in on this commentary and find these conversations unfolding uh, with a level, a, a level of um, focus uh, and insight that um, would be like top level seminar feedback or comments from discussion, uh, but in each instance, basically. So hypothesis really fit this underlying model for field work, like students could go away, do their research and analysis and share their reflections. It offers a kind of capacious approach that lets students get out uh, get out of the activity as much as they're willing or able to put into it. So it's, it was flexible too. Um, if a student wanted to post the minimum number of comments, that's totally fine. But if they kind of got caught up in it, it would, it would yield as much as they were willing to put into it in terms of a kind of um, what they're working through learning. And the bonus is they actually learn how to use a web annotation tool even as they're modeling excellent seminar discussion, right? So there's kind of multiple things going on at once here. Um, I think the fact that they're writing directly in the margins of the short story should not be overlooked, right? I think it elevates the exercise above having students read a story and respond in a blog post, which is basically what the exercise is, um, because they can cross-reference their classmates' points against the text itself as they read the story. So it's right there. And I love that image that um, Jeremy put up uh, with the marginalia kind of spreading out, um, the kind of Talmudic tradition of this commentary on commentary on commentary, right? And there's always more to say. And I, I'm sure I do have more to say, but I'm gonna stop there. I'll look forward to the general discussion, and I uh, will 
maybe turn it over to Lillian to turn it over to Albana, or we can go straight to Albana. I don't want to uh, disrupt yeah, the order of things. We can go straight to, to Albana. We don't have too much structure here. So, um, Albana, why don't you uh, just give us a little insight into your experience as a, a student in this course? Sure. So, hi, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to take part. Thank you, Brent, for inviting me. And um, I think it's interesting just to kind of see the flow of how we've been talking. Because my first point, I like writing notes, is marginalia. I don't know if everybody can see. So one of the things that I noticed while using this tool is actually in a kind of cross-reference to another course that I took. And we discussed what is a book, right? Like how, how can students see themselves developing more with e-learning and also like how can we use online readings to make education more accessible, right? And then one of the first things that a lot of people said is just losing that connection with the book and losing marginalia. And I was thinking about other like writers that we learned about like Bram Stoker and the kind of mythology around his marginalia and how you can find it. So that for me was the first thing that I noticed is it kind of takes it back. It was exciting to look at a lot of the annotated things to see everything marked up. And I think in an online class as well, sometimes what happens with discussion posts is it kind of starts like this, where there's a big kind of, this is my idea, and then the comments kind of get smaller and smaller. And then I found that with the annotations, it was the other way around where it'd almost be like a question, what does this word mean? And then all of a sudden the comments were kind of inverted, right? Like it would go off from a discussion on that point. And I think that's really, really important because like Brent said, right? If we're doing this online, we don't wanna miss that seminar feel to what we're learning. And I think that it was really important to kind of speak to other students against the text. So a specific example that I was thinking about was that there was the use of alliteration in one of the stories that I looked at and the alliteration came off of the page into another page and into another paragraph. And it'd be really hard to talk about that in a discussion post where you think, so on this page, if everyone can look back and look at this, because sometimes you might not you might lose the kind of effect of reading it right away. But then in the stories, when you look at it and you can say, look at the way that this alliteration comes into the next paragraph, people can say, oh yeah, that makes sense. And that looks back to this metaphor that I was using. So I think that that was really important. And yeah, again, I think that it just worked really well as a discussion point. So we didn't get to use it uh, like Brent said, uh, as a literary Facebook, I was thinking about that question since you mentioned it, Jeremy. But it'd be really exciting to see that. When I was looking up uh, the tool, I saw that you can use it as a Chrome extension, like you can use it as an extension. So it'd be nice to kind of hear more about how that would work because it was really easy to use in Blackboard the way that we used it. But it'd be nice to kind of see, again, how you can use it as a more of like a social media tool. And I think that's everything that I have. Thank you so much, Alana, for sharing your perspective. Thank you, Brent. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I really appreciate all of you guys being here today. And so we've got a little bit of time uh, for Q&A. Um, I'm also going to pose this question to the group. Jeremy has been so kind as to offer us a little bit of a demo of the tool if you'd like to see in, in action. So um, just go ahead and let me know in the chat if that is something that you want to reserve a little bit of time for, uh, just to help give some, some context. Uh, meanwhile, we've got one open question in the Q&A. Keep putting them in there, you guys. Um, and that is from Emily. And Emily asks uh, for you, Alana, as a student, how long did it take you to familiarize yourself with the tool? How hard was it to learn? Um, I think that it worked out pretty easily. I think going back to Brent's point and talking about how you kind of need to have a basis there to start off with, with it. Um, 
I think that's really true. On some stories where I didn't see a lot of annotation, it kind of felt scary to use it, but in other ones where stuff was already marked up, I think that it felt really familiar. That is awesome. Um, and then as people continue uh, to, to type their questions in the Q&A, I have a couple uh, of questions. Oh, you know what? I'm going to let Jess's a question, which is also for you, Alvana, uh, keep, keep putting you on the spot. Um, would you have found it more engaging to use hypothesis openly on the web with people outside of your classroom? Um, or um, did you like that you were using it just with people from your class? How would you uh, contrast this with your experience using it in Blackboard? Um, I think it was really interesting to see it in a class setting. I think that was a nice way to start with it. I think that I've used tools similar to that. And I see Andrew's in the chat now. And I'm going to just say something about his class before. It's kind of cool to see it kind of channeling back. So what we've done in Andrew's class is that we've done like a collaborative note taking all together, which has been really interesting. So I think I'm like using that as another case. I think using it in a class is a really nice stepping stone. And I think that it'd be nice to kind of expand from there. So introducing it to students, but then also maybe offering something just like this where we can think about how to use it for everyday reading, but also for different studies. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so as questions continue to come in, I have a question for Brent. Um, mm -hmm. Brent, you mentioned that this is your first time teaching an online class. So I, first of all, applaud you for not only uh, moving to an online course when you've never taken nor taught one before, but also implementing a new tool. Um, I was hoping you could just tell us a little bit about if there's anything you would do differently after your first round. Yes. Uh, as I let the answer to that question percolate, I did want to speak to this question of using um, hypothesis through the LMS versus using it um, through the Chrome extension. Absolutely. And that's just to say that through the LMS, because we're kind of, they're constrained instances, um, I think you miss out on some of the features. And one of those that I just discovered, refreshing Health Canada's COVID-19 page as frequently as I am, I noticed a hypothesis annotation there. And when I clicked over to it, I saw that um, it was just two, there were just two tags there. And I didn't know about this function for hypothesis, but, but the, it seems incredibly powerful to be able to tag resources and almost create a, a bibliography, uh, but a, in a public kind of way. So that's something that I am thinking through like, oh, maybe it would be worth having the, the LMS instance, but also providing um, the, an avenue for students to move, you know, into their own um, accounts and to use the tool for their own work uh, outside of a specific class. But let me just say about this online class that it was uh, incredible having the support of the institution and of Trent Online putting this together. There's so many great ideas to work through in how to do this, and I could see kind of was really obvious to me when something came along, such as hypothesis, where I was like, oh, I want to use this. This is something I want to integrate. But that kind of had a snowball effect. Where there's a, the class is really, and Albana can attest to this, like we have uh, field work, we have, you know, like collaborative bibliographies and a, a research essay and like a course lexicon that's using a wiki within Black. So there's like a lot of stuff. And I think I would just, Pair, pair it back a little bit uh, and sort of see w what worked best and go with that uh, because this first iteration was a lot of like, I'm going to try most of the things and see uh, what really works. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for, for that answer. Um, I see we've got a question in the chat. I just want to 
illuminate it and then I will mark it as answered. Um, so Blair asks, have you had any issues with students in China using Hypothesis or is it not blocked? And I just want to point out that we also have Nate here from Hypothesis and he says that there is a lot of use of Hypothesis in China. It's definitely not blocked. Um, but of course, it does sit on top of resources, so you'd have to make sure that the student would have access to those resources as well, as well that those resources could potentially uh, be blocked. And then, uh, Jeremy, if you have anything to add to, to that, or if, you know, just give me a thumbs up if that's a thorough answer from Nate, uh, that would be great. Thumbs up, there, uh, done, okay. All right. Um, Jeremy, I had a question uh, for you about uh, we were talking a little bit about moving from the LMS um, into using this as a regular tool for your just generally engaging in the social web. Do you have experiences with uh, other faculty that have sort of facilitated uh, that transition from using this as a, a teaching and learning tool to using it as a, just a way to engage with the internet? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's where our origins come from. Um, you know, originally we didn't have anything like private groups. Um, we just had a Chrome extension that allowed people to annotate publicly on the web. And so the initial instructors that were using us um, were having students annotate publicly on the web as part of their courses. Um, and then, of course, students had their own accounts and could, you know, move, move beyond the course. And we do often hear from students that keep using the tool, um, whether it's, uh, you know, for personal note taking and study groups, you know, in school, but also moving um, you know, out into sort of public discourse. And as an English instructor, to me, the exciting thing here is like I always taught annotation and now annotation is part of the web. So that thing that I was always making students do um, is now sort of part of the infrastructure of the web, which is really exciting. Um, and one piece of that infrastructure is the fact that every uh, annotation online has a URL. So my, my colleague John likes to talk about how if you think about the web as, as a sort of internet information fabric, um, where really the threads are uh, URLs, web pages. Um, annotation increases the thread count of that information quilt or whatever it is. I guess it's not a quilt, it's a knitted blanket or something like that. But it increases the thread count because each of those little annotations can suddenly be pointed to directly. That's a little bit of a side point, but the LMS uh, app is a different tool. Um, and so students in Brent's class have, you know, single sign on through LTI in the LMS and are able to get started annotating without any account creation or joining a group. There's a private group correlated to the, to the class roster. Um, and so Albana's uh, uh, account there will work in other courses at Trent, but that account will not work on the web. So there is right now a division between um, hypothesis accounts created in the LMS and hypothesis accounts used on the web. Now, plenty of teachers are, you know, leverage that single sign-on to get students started with the tool and with the practice of annotation and then say, okay, some later assignments or later activities are gonna involve a web account and now you have to sign up yourself. Um, and so people do transition and people do, you know, as it were, uh, push, push the students off into the wild of the web with the tool to, to continue their annotation practice. But it should be said, you know, it should be clear that right now the LMS is kind of, that, that application is walled off for security and privacy reasons. Um, and we do want to create a, a more seamless way for Albana to say, whoa, this cool tool that Brent, you know, my professor introduced me to, I want to take it with me and use beyond Trent, or maybe I transfer universities, not that there's anything wrong with Trent, but you know, people move around between different spaces, um, or she graduates Trent and wants to go annotate on the web, that she can somehow offload her, bring her annotations with her. And the infrastructure around the way that we've built annotation in our service through a, um, through a uh, standard allows for that to happen quite easily uh, once we get around to that particular pathway for Albana to take her annotations with her and start annotating on the web using the, the browser extension. Sorry for a long-winded answer. <laughs> no, that's really, really helpful. Um, and I think that might be a really lovely transition into uh, a demo if, if you're ready, or if you need to queue it up, I can ask one more question while you do that. <laughs> uh, no, I'm happy to queue it up. Um, so let me just share screens here. Not only have I gotten things up and running, but I didn't prepare this ahead of time, but I, I normally like to demo with um, poetry uh, since I'm an English professor and poems are small pieces of text. And so I usually like to demo, I'm gonna do it in Moodle. I could also do it in Canvas. I might move back and forth. Again, it's, L it's LTI compliant. So it works in any, most of that major LMSs, um, D2L Brightspace, Blackboard, uh, Canvas, Instructure Canvas and, and Moodle, Sakai as well. 
uh, Schoolology, apparently Blackbaud now as well. I didn't know that there's also a, an LMS called Blackbaud, which just in terms of LMS history, which I'm sure you all are very interested in. Blackbaud preceded Blackboard. I just find it sort of hilarious that there's two sort of BB LMSs. Anyway, side point. Um, here, here's a course in Moodle. Uh, you can see I, I sort of create these sections for where I'm demoing. And so now we're um, you know, in Ontario, and I believe the poet Ann Carson um, is from uh, Toronto originally. So I'm gonna add a, a poem by Ann Carson to uh, my course here. So, but otherwise, you know, I can open up a text within the LMS um, and it'll open up the text and then add hypothesis and allow for uh, annotation. Looks like things are a little slow this morning. Um, but there we have the poem. I'm actually taking it from the Poetry Foundation. And then here's a sidebar. So pretend I'm a student, I've come to this reading, a, co a colleague of mine, a classmate of mine has already started annotating. I can reply to an existing annotation or annotate and create a highlight, which is private, and create annotation, which can be public or private. I can make the annotation just for me, or I can share it with my course, which is Poetry 101. Um, and that's what all of these resources are. They open up to uh, the poem with hypothesis added and students are logged in, creating an account. An account is created for them, they're logged in, they can begin annotating immediately. Um, and let me walk you through the workflow of how that looks. So in, uh, in um, Moodle, I will uh, you know, turn on editing and add an activity or resource. I'll choose type external tool. My friendly neighborhood admin will have already uh, installed hypothesis uh, for me in my course, so I can just go in and add it here. Um, I can give it a title. Um, hypothesis readings are annotation enabled readings. They can be graded or not graded, and every LMS has the option of just adding annotation to your readings or adding annotations that are then uh, connected to a gradebook uh, uh, line, right? Um, and so that's, I just do that through the LMS right here. I would, uh, let me see where I do this. Actually, I go to grade and I can say what I want it out of. Um, and I think it's, I have to move between all the different LMSs. So I sometimes get confused about a new play. Oh, it's in privacy. Um, I can say accept grades from the tool. Uh, or if I say I don't accept grades, it will just be an annotated, annotatable assignment or sorry, yeah, just an annotatable reading. But if I accept grades, it'll be for grade. Um, and then I can save and return to the course. So I've made this a graded one. And this is the basic uh, view where a teacher will configure a hypothesis assignment um, for their students. It's where they select the text. Uh, in Moodle, you have two options. You can either grab a URL or you can grab a PDF from a Google Drive account that you associate. Um, in Canvas, we also have an option to work with the Canvas files um, and in other LMSs, we'll be bringing this working with the file system of the, of the LMS itself. Um, but let's just say we want to add that Ann Carson poem. I've already looked it up and I can grab it here, just the URL and go back to Moodle, rather back to this page and click on enter a, a URL, pop that in. And now you'll see this is our grade bar that conveniently shows up. I slid it at first. Um, and now we see the poem and we see the hypothesis sidebar. Of course, there's no annotations yet scoped to a group called Poetry 101, which is the name of the course. I'm logged in as, I guess, anonymous in this case. Um, and then I can select text and begin annotating. Now, it should be just to point out the difference between the LMS integration. If I annotate here, something smart, this won't appear on the Poetry Foundation page. Right. This is the actual poem at the Poetry Foundation. I've just refreshed it. I can turn on the Chrome extension. Again, this is, you don't need to do this if you want to stick inside the LMS, but just to demonstrate the difference. I've now activated uh, Hypothesis on top of this Poetry Foundation page. You'll see the same familiar sidebar, but you'll see this public layer is the default, right? And my annotations here are going to be uh, totally distinct from, um, from the ones inside the LMS. Uh, and I can't access those ones from inside the LMS right now when I'm working uh, on the web. Um, and then finally, I'll just show you what the grading interface looks like in Canvas because it's kind of a little bit more robust there. Um, but the point of the grading interface is that, and again, this is where we get at that idea of, of making reading visible in powerful ways. 
and really being able to be present and engaged with students as they encounter a text and begin to enact the kind of uh, skills and activities that one you want them to around a text. It really can range for whatever you as an instructor want out of them. It may be close reading poetry. It may be, as Albana pointed out, like something about a particular literary device. Uh, it may be something uh, different in a science course, right, where it has to do with uh, scientific research publications. Um, but what I'm able to do with this poem where you can see this Mary Oliver poem, there's a decent discussion here, lots of comments and replies, threaded conversations in the margin. Um, what I can do in SpeedGrader in Canvas is view each student's contributions in isolation, right? So we have the big picture uh, here, sorry, over here, all the group annotations in one place can get a little messy. And then in the grading view, I can see just model students' annotations here and give them a grade, whatever, however I wanna do the grading and give them a comment as well. And I can cycle through my students so then I can see uh, class clown who hasn't done the homework, right? So they're gonna get a different comment. They didn't contribute anything to the conversation. Um, and then, you know, teacher's pet has a different annotation set. Um, I think the grading integration is really cool, um, but it's really up to you whether you uh, decide to make this a gradable activity or not. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. I think that's really helpful for contextualizing what it looks like both for a student and an instructor who is uh, interested in, in using this tool. I really appreciate you giving examples that are English and also science. Um, just want to point out a question in the chat that we have about accessibility. Uh, and Nate has really graciously dropped the link to uh, information about accessibility um, uh, for Hypothesis. The, the short story is that it's WCAGAA compliant, um, but it's also undergoing an independent review from our, our local team of, of excellent uh, accessibility experts at OPEDU, the folks at the uh, Inclusive Design Research is, I want to say, <laughs> um, who, have, who have done a, a lot of product reviews of, of uh, open source technology in the, in the past for uh, voluntary uh, accessibility documents. Um, so hopefully we'll have a sense of how that's AODA compliant pretty, pretty soon. Um, but generally, uh, you guys have built a, a beautiful tool that's quite usable by, um, anybody and I'll mark that as um answered and um I just want uh to uh give it one more minute in case there are any other questions usually we like to end these about 10 minutes early just to give people time to stretch before their next um video meeting as it may be right now uh if there are any other questions feel free to pop them uh in in the chat uh right now um, and otherwise, I can start my end of the webinar spiel. <laughs> um, so I just want to thank you guys again so, so much for, for being here. Uh, thank you, Brent, for your uh, perspective on teaching, Alpana, for your perspective on using this as a, as a student, and um, uh, Jeremy for the, for the demo. Um, I know that Hypothesis has a lot of interesting stuff going on, so make sure that you guys keep in touch with the team at Hypothesis. Um, yes, it's uh, WCAG compliant currently. Yes, Rob. Um, and um, uh, we'll make sure that we get like tw Twitter handles or whatever uh, kind of contact information that we need. Um, I just also want to mention that these webinars are a part of uh, the Ontario Open Library Network. Um, and we are so grateful to, to have such a wonderful network of folks in Ontario uh librarians faculty students instructional designers educational technologists that are interested in open educational resources open edu uh, educational practices and open educational tools like hypothesis um the oln community is open to anyone after this webinar you'll be taken to a, a link in case you want to join the collaborative notes are there jeremy's presentation is there and um in our slack we now have a channel as of a few minutes ago the devoted to learning more uh, about hypothesis, if you have questions about it, or if you want to exchange ideas um, if, about how you might use it in your in your teaching, so there's a just devoted space um, for that. Um, we could not do this without this amazing community of, of people, uh, of educators, and so we are so so very grateful. Um, and finally, um, 
I'd love if you would save the date for our next community webinar. We do these webinars uh, once a month on the second Tuesday of every month from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, and our next webinar is going to be open in Ontario 2020. 2021. Um, so if you're interested in hearing about what our plans are at eCampus Ontario for the coming year uh, related to open education uh, resources, tools, practices, um, tune in. And if you have a project that you're working on in 2020, 2021 that you want to tell us about, we would love to hear from you. Just send uh, me a quick email at open at eCampusOntario.ca and let me know uh, so we can try to make this about everybody uh, and all the great work that's going on in in our province um once again thank you so much for being here when you leave the webinar you'll be taken to a short survey about your experience what you want to learn more about um would love if you would fill that out uh otherwise uh, we'll see you at the next one thank you so much everybody thank you jeremy albana and brent uh we really appreciate you thank you thank you all